So welcome everybody to the Stoke Mandeville Plastic Surgery Educational Series. My name is James Chan. I'm one of the consultants at Stoke Mandeville Hospital. So thanks everybody for taking the time to join us today. And I'm delighted to say that this educational series is going from strength to strength. We're very grateful for the support of both Plaster and Icoplast. And today cert is certainly a highlight of our series with Professor Peter Nelligan from the University of Washington, where he's director of the Center for Reconstructive uh, Surgery. And he's joining us today to share his insights on per perforator flaps. Now, Professor Nelligan needs no introduction. When I, um, when I mentioned this event to my friends, they all said, what, as in the textbook? So <laughs> I first met Peter last year when I was a microsurgery fellow at the Changgung Memorial Hospital in Taiwan. And Peter was one of the keynote speakers at the World Symposium for Lymphedema Surgery. And I was tasked to pick him up and drop him off at the airport. And what struck me was just how, how nice and how down to earth he was. He just got, got off a red eye flight, was probably knackered. And there I was bombarding him with questions on microsurgery and lymphedema surgery and so on. And to his credit, he very graciously and patiently answered all my questions. And for that, I'm forever grateful. Um, when we started our webinar series, I Facebook messaged him, no less, thinking there's nothing to lose. And to my surprise, I got a yes back within minutes. So I'm proud and delighted to welcome you, Peter, on behalf of the 500 participants from lots of different countries on our educational program. And to the participants, I'm sure many of you will have questions and points you'd like to raise. So please do jot these down in the Q&A box not the chat box, the Q&A box at um, the bottom right. And we'll get to as many of these as possible in the Q&A session afterwards. So enjoy. Um, just before we get started, let's have a look at the results of the poll. Lovely, so we've ended the poll there. I hope you can all see the results. 195 people voted with 40% occasionally performing perforator flaps, 24% regularly, 23% um, rarely, and 12% never. Um, so a great sp spread there and um, almost what you would expect. So great to see so many people voting there and we'll see hopefully a lot um, to take home and keep practicing with what we're about to learn here. Thanks for completing that. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy, Peter, please. Thank you very much and thank you for the, uh, for the invitation. It's, it's really delightful to be here. Um, uh, let me just get this started. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. So um, I'm gonna talk about um, perforator flaps and particularly where they fit in our armamentarium because they're, they're one of the tools in our toolbox and by no means are they uh, you know, the be all and the end all. Um, my, my disclosures are uh, book chapters and, and James and, and Demi asked me to, to say a few words about, uh, about uh, the, the, the big textbook because we've just started doing um, the next edition. Uh, I first did the third edition uh, in 2012, and then we did the fourth edition, which came out in 2017. And we've just started the process of doing the fifth edition. And uh, James and Demi asked me to just explain what, what's involved. So um, just this past two weeks, we have, um, uh, with uh, Elsevier in, in, in London, uh, Belin uh, Belinda Kuhn is the name of the um, publisher, uh, we've done Zoom meetings with the volume editors and we've appointed some uh, co-editors on this edition. And uh, with the Zoom meetings, we've just uh, met with them to discuss uh, what our plans are for the book, uh, sent them the, the table of contents and, and um, given them instructions on what we need. And this time we want to do a, a fairly major uh, revision of the book uh, so that people aren't just going to go to a stand at a, at a meeting and say, well, that's the same as, uh, as the one I have at home. Um, so we're gonna have lots more videos, uh, lots of PowerPoint presentations. Uh, we're going to have uh, uh, bullet points at the beginning of each chapter, which are clickable so that somebody can uh, go directly to the part of the chapter that they want. And the timeline is that um, we'll have all of this, uh, um, the table of contents worked out with the volume editors by the end of the summer. And then uh, in the fall, we'll send out um, invitations to the uh, the various authors, um, and we would expect to have chap chapters start to come in uh, 
uh, by the middle of 2021. And that'll probably continue over the, the next year. So uh, we'll hopefully have finished the editing process by, um, by the summer of 2022. Um, and then after that, we have to get everything ready for publication. And that involves um, going through galley proofs, um, going through scatter proofs. Scatter proofs are where they, they send me the um, print uh, quality pictures of all the illustrations and all the photographs. And I have to go through them and make sure that the photographs are cropped properly, that the color is correct, and that they're in the right place in the chapters. And, um, and then we go through the process of, of designing the, or selecting the, the cover design and the page format and all of that. And the plan is to have this published by uh, 2023. So it's a, it's a process that takes several years. Um, and incidentally, if any, of you, if any of you watching this have any suggestions on what you would like uh, to see in the new book, or changes that you would want to see, feel free to email me and let me know, because we can incorporate some of those. Now is the time to do that, because we're, we really want to make this um, different and dynamic. So I'll get on with the, the talk on perforator flaps. So if we look at where we've come um, from uh, in flap surgery, we started off with with random flaps and then axial flaps and then my cutaneous flaps came along and, and perforator flaps really just represent the next echelon of our, of our anatomic uh, understanding. And um, the advantages of perforator flaps are that it gives you precision in terms of donor tissue selection. So not infrequently, if I have a um, you know, given defect, I, I, will, I may give the patient the option of a couple of different flaps and they can make the choice based on where they want their donor scar to be, or you know, don't always do that, but it's, it's an option that I can give patients. Um, the perforator flaps also give you increased versatility at the reconstructive site, because in the past we took a flap that contained you know, blood, um, blood supply, muscle, skin, fat, often transferring more tissue than we needed. And with the perforator flaps, you can really uh, hone down on the tissue that, that you actually need for your reconstruction. You also get a longer pedicle length, whether you're using it as a free flap or as a perforator flap, because you don't have the little intramuscular branches um, tethering your flap to the, to the muscle. And uh, so you get a nice long pedicle length that uh, allows a greater arc of rotation if you're using it as a pedicle flap. This is actually a, a DIEP flap that's being used for head and neck reconstruction. And you can uh, appreciate the length of the pedicle but you can also see all the little um, the clips on the, various, um, uh, on, on the various muscular branches that I've actually uh, clipped, um, uh, freeing up that um, perforator from its tether, tether, tethering to the muscle. The disadvantage of perforator flaps are that uh, they require detailed knowledge of, uh, of vascular anatomy, um, and the dissection is more tedious than, in, than with, um, for example, a similar myocutaneous flap um, and there's a potential for pedicle injury. So it requires a, a particular technique of dissection um, uh, in order to prepare your flap. Now, some people think that, you know, you should use a perforator flap for everything. And, and I think that's, that's rubbish. Um, use whatever flap is best or, or whatever flap is best in your hands. So where do they fit in our, in our armamentarium? Well, I think, I think they're a great addition to our armamentarium rather than a replacement for existing flaps. Um, but as I mentioned, the perforators do demand a particular technique of, uh, of dissection. And uh, we can boil it down to three types of perforator that we use in designing our flaps. There are the, the direct perforators, which are perforators that come from a source vessel directly to the skin. Um, the more common ones that we use are the muscle perforators that pass through a muscle, give branches to the muscle, and then supply the overlying skin. And of course, we have the septal perforators that pass up from the fiber septa between muscle groups. And basically, these three types of perforator um, supply all the perforator flaps in the body. And there are over 400 perforator flaps that have been, or perforators that have been identified. So the perforator is dissected out from within the muscle. And um, one of the things that does is it um, the, the traditional align, alignment of the flap to the underlying muscle is no longer necessarily valid. When I first started doing uh, flaps as, as a registrar in the 70s, uh, my cutaneous flaps were just coming out. And we used to actually stitch the skin pad to the underlying muscle in order to avoid 
as damaging the perforators. And now we're actually dissecting out those perforators. And, and what that means is that you can design the skin panel based uh, on the perforator rather than on the underlying muscle. As long as you've got, as as you've got your perforator going into your flap, uh, then you know you're going to be fine. So what do you need? Well, the first thing, the one thing that you absolutely need is a doctor uh, to find your perforator. And then all of the other things um, are nice to have, but not absolutely necessary in order to do uh, a perforator flap. Uh, and one of them, of course, is the CT angiogram. Uh, and you've all seen images like this, this is the umbilicus. This is a perforator coming from the deep inferior epigastric system. And you're all familiar with the, this um, uh, uh, appearance on a CT where you've got a nice perforator coming out from the rectus muscle. And what does the CT tell you? Well, it, um, it gives you good information about the position of the perforator. It gives you good information about the course. So you can identify, for example, if you've got a perforator with a long intramuscular course, you know that that's gonna be a more tedious dissection than one that's just going straight through the muscle. It gives you some information about caliber Though sometimes you'll see what looks like a big perforator on a CT scan, and then when you're actually going to do the case, it's not as big as it looked on the CT. The one thing it doesn't give you is it doesn't give you any information about perfusion capacity. So you can see the perforator, but you don't know how, how big of a flap or how big a piece of tissue that perforator is going to carry. And that's where, where um, ICG comes in. Uh, Endosinine Green um, gives you real-time information on uh, perfusion. Uh, this is a, a DIAP flap uh, that's uh, been in, a patient's been injected with ICG, and here you start to see the flap light up. And the ICG is actually very accurate, and, and this has kind of changed the way I do my DIAP flaps. What I used to do uh, initially was dissect until I found the biggest perforator I could see. Then when CT angiography came along, I would go for the biggest perforator on the CT. And now what I do is I'll dissect out all the perforators uh, above the fascia, and then I'll put a little clamp on, a little accent clamp on all the perforators that I don't think I'm going to need, leaving the perforator that I've chosen. Uh, and then I inject my ICG. And probably about 10% of the time, I'll end up taking one other perforator because the perforator that I've chosen isn't quite enough. And you just mark off the area of the flap that's not perfusing and discard that. And this is an example. This is an ALT flap that we're raising. This is a, a superficial ALT flap. And um, you'll see that there are two perforators here. There's one more or less in the middle of the flap right there. And there's another one uh, distally right there. And you see, I'm just dividing the fascia between the two. And really what I want to know is, can I take that flap on the more proximal perforator? Because avoiding um, the section of the distal one is going to save me a lot of time. And you can see there's a clamp on the distal perforator on the left of your screen. And the tip of the flap is not perfusing. The proximal portion of the perfusing nicely. And you can see my resident on the right hand side, he's going to turn around and take the clamp off that uh, perforator. Um, and as soon as he does, you can see that the uh, distal end of the flap perfuses. It lights up right away. So that's telling me that I need both of those perforators. And if I don't take that distal perforator with my flap, I'm going to lose the tip of my flap. So it's, it's extremely useful. The new kid on the block is, is uh, thermography. And thermography is, is, um, is wonderful because um, it's cheap and uh, it appears to be fairly accurate. And I've been using uh, thermography with um, uh, ICG and CT angio just so I can establish to my own satisfaction that it is accurate. But this is um, a, a DIAP um, and you see two perforators right here start to light up. You can see the pulsation and you can see that they're also joined, which means there's a direct communication between those perforators. Over here, there's another one which isn't perfusing to the other two right away, it's starting to fill up here. Those are choke vessels that are opening up. And if you wait long enough, you'll see the whole flap uh, you know, light up and tell you how much uh, of the flap perfuses. And the nice thing about this, that FLIR camera costs about $250 in the app store, it fits on your iPhone. So it's really, really cheap. And the way I use it is I'll, I'll uh, get a green towel when the patient's been on the table asleep and people are fussing, putting foleys in and, and checking their lines and stuff. I get a green towel, soak it in uh, ice water and put it on the, the arm or the leg or the belly or wherever I'm taking my flap from. And I'll leave it there for about 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And then I take it off and run my, my FLIR video and you get the sort of image I just showed you. So what do you need to know? Um, 
you need to know the anatomy, obviously, but you also need to know uh, perforator patterns. And there are distinct uh, perforator patterns that are very useful to know. So there are basically four perforator patterns. Um, there are perforators with a short intramuscular course, there are perforators with a long intramuscular course, um, and there are perforators with a, a subfascial segment. And those ones are important to know because you can easily damage the subfascial element of the perforator. And I'll show you a diagram of that in a minute. Then there are paramuscular perforators. We sometimes see them on the abdomen coming around the medial side of the rectus muscle. Sometimes you'll see them with the Tdap flap where they, instead of going through the latissimus dorsi, they go around the, um, the lateral border or the anterior border of the latissimus. And then in the abdomen, there's another type of perforator that, that is useful uh, to appreciate, and that is the uh, um, perforator at the tendon's inscription, because those ones are particularly difficult to dissect out. Um, and if you know ahead of time uh, that, that it's uh, at a tendon's inscription, it makes your life very, very, very much easier, particularly in terms of choosing perforators. So this is just a diagrammatic representation of that. And this is the simplest perforator. This is a direct perforator where it just goes up through the muscle, through the fascia, into the skin. And that's an easy dissection. The one with the long intramuscular course is a more difficult dissection because there are multiple muscular branches that you have to control during the dissection. And then this is the one with the subfascial segment. You get a perforator that goes up through the muscle and then it runs along under the fascia before piercing the fascia. And if you're not aware of that, then when you're opening the fascia, it's very easy to damage the uh, underlying um, uh, perforator. So always watch out for that one. Um, then there's the, the, the para, paramuscular perforators, or sometimes these are septal perforators, but I think paramuscular and septal are not always the same. And then of course, there are the um, perforators at the tendinous inscription. So I'm gonna show you a bunch of examples. We'll start at the top and, and, and go down to the bottom. And uh, I can't show you every perforator, but I'm gonna show you perforators that I find useful and that are, that are good to know. Uh, the first one is the facial artery perforator flap. And um, it's, it's a useful flap to know. Uh, for many of the defects that you use this for, there are other ways of closing the defect. So it's not the only way of closing a particular defect, but it is very, very useful. This is a patient who had a melanoma excision. And as I said, there's lots of ways you could close this. But if you get your Doppler out and you run your Doppler along the facial artery, you hear these little crescendos of noise along the facial artery. And each of those represents a perforator coming from the facial artery. And you can design a flap based on those perforators. And what you can do is make an exploratory incision um, to look at the perforator and make sure that you're happy with the perforator. And I'm happy with the perforator if I can see a pulsating perforator. Now these, these facial artery perforators are extremely small, but it's important to see that there's a pulsation in it. If you're just seeing a little stringy thing with no pulsation, then I would just close that exploratory incision and do something else. And people say, well, how big a flap can you take? Well, you can take the territory of two of those perforators. And you can see I've designed this flap based on a perforator right adjacent to the uh, defect and I've taken that territory and the territory of the next perforator. Once you go into the third uh, territory, then you're getting into random flap. Um, uh, you're getting into a random flap that is less reliable. And in different parts of the body, the perforators are spaced differently. So in the face, they're very close together. So you can only take a small flap. But in the lower leg, for example, using the posterior tibial perforators, those are much more widely spaced. And you can Doppler out all of those perforators and uh, safely design a fairly, large, uh, a fairly large flap. The other nice thing about these perforators is that the Doppler is your friend. So the, you find the perforator with your Doppler, you do your dissection, you get your flap ready, and then you rotate it or advance it, whatever you're going to do with the, with the flap, and you listen with your Doppler again. If your Doppler signal is still there, you're good. You can just close and go home. If your Doppler signal is gone, then it means that um, you're, pedicle is strangulated. And the most common mistake I see people make is that they don't dissect the perforator down to the source vessel. So the perforator is, uh, is too short. And when they, when they turn it through 90 or 180, they kink it. Um, if you go down to the source vessel, uh, you usually have enough length to enable you to rotate it. And um, sometimes you may have some uh, strings of, of soft tissue or some uh, bits of soft tissue that are strangulating the, the pedicle. And you just, you know, with magnification, you go down and you you skeletonize the, uh, the vessels. This is an example of a, one I did just a couple of weeks ago, a guy with a 
a melanoma meets the cheek that we did a facial artery perforator, just checking the Doppler at the end of the rotation. Um, and here he is uh, postoperatively. And this is just to show you the anatomy. So this is a, a woman in her 60s who had um, radiation for acne as a teenager. And throughout her life, she's had multiple uh, squamous cell and basal cell carcinomas. She's got a big, ugly flap on her, uh, on her forehead, as you can see. Uh, and she's had a rhinectomy. And while we were waiting to reduce that flap, debug that flap, and do a nasal reconstruction, she came back with a recurrent disease in, or new disease in her lip. And so for this, we designed a facial artery perforator. And again, taking two territories, as you can see here. And this is the anatomy. So you, here are the two perforators. And when you dissect it some more, you see this is the facial artery. This is the superior labial artery and the two perforators coming off it. And uh, what we did in this case was to just uh, clamp the facial artery. Um, you, can, you can clamp it and, and, and assess it just by, by vision. Nowadays, what I tend to do is use ICG to make sure my flap is perfusing. And in this case, the superior lab labial artery was perfusing through those perforators very nicely and we were able to uh, rotate it. Unfortunately, this patient died within a couple of months of this from extension of the, uh, the squamous cell that had been on her forehead. So another very useful flap is the submental flap. Uh, this is a patient with a more fearform basal cell carcinoma of the upper lip. And again, there are lots of different ways for closing something like this. This is her defect, and you can see we've partially closed it by advancement. And here we've got a mental flap prepared. This is the pedicle, and simply tunneled up into the, uh, into the upper lip. And uh, this is the anatomy, just to show you. So this is the um, uh, anterior belly of the digastric. Um, and uh, we have um, uh, divided it and flipped it over. So you look at the undersurface of it. And they're usually two perforators that run up on either side of the anterior belly of digastric. And some people will dissect those out and take it as a pure perforator flap. But I, there's no morbidity associated with taking the anterior belly of digastric. So I just, I, I just do that. The important bit of the anatomy is here. So this is the submental artery with the vena comitantes that are you know, intimately associated with it, like any vena comitantes. But right beside that, um, there's another vein coming from the anterior facial vein. And it's important to incorporate that vein in your flap um, because I'll show you what happens if you don't. Um, so what I like to do is I like to find my perforator, find my pedicle first, ensure that I've got both the submental and the, uh, and the uh, submental vein with me in my flap and then I dissect from pedicle side to non-pedicle side. On the pedicle side, I take the anterior belly of the digastric. Once I hit the midline, I go above digastric. I take platysma with me with the flap. And, and this is what that flap looks like afterwards. These flaps always look a little bit um, beat up initially, uh, but here she is afterwards. And I think you'll agree the color and texture match is, is, is unsurpassed. And one of the nicest things about this flap is this, this is the donor scar. So patients don't see the donor scar. And particularly in elderly patients, if they have a loose neck, it tightens up their neck and they're really delighted with the, with the result. So this is uh, what happens if you miss that vein. This is a patient with uh, Spitzoid Nevis syndrome. You can see she's had a previous, um, she's had a previous forehead flap, uh, but now she comes back with disease in the upper lip requiring excision and we excised it and closed it with the submental flap. Here's the submental flap, not looking very happy. Fortunately, we were able to leach it and we got away with it. But the reason that happened was that I didn't incorporate that um, uh, branch of the facial vein uh, with the flap. Um, and this is what she looked like when she left the hospital. And, and this is what she looks like now. So we got away with it. Uh, but the way to avoid that is to make sure that you identify and keep that vein with your flap. This is another patient who came with a squamous cell carcinoma on her face and, and we thought, well, uh, this is great for facial artery perforator flap. And it was summertime and she came with her daughter with whom she lived and she was wearing a coat and, and her daughter said, mom, take your coat off. And she was very reluctant to take her coat off and eventually she did. And when she took her coat off, this is why she didn't want to take her coat off. She had this huge uh, sessile squamous cell on her shoulder. And uh, this was, was her excision. And one of my favorite flaps for, for this area is the uh, parascapular flap. So this is the circumflex scapular artery. Um, and you can take a very large flap with this vessel. Uh, if you need increased pedicle length, it also supplies the lateral border of the scapula. You can take it as an osteocutaneous flap if you need bone. 
But if you don't need bone, and in this case, you wanted a longer pedicle in order to uh, rotate it up to the shoulder, you just divide the uh, branches to the lateral border of the scapula. And then that brings you right down into the axilla and you get a, a very long uh, flap that will, a uh, very long pedicle that will tolerate being rotated uh, without a problem. And this is the rotation. The other nice, nice thing about um, that flap, even in young patients, um, the flank is fairly lax and you can take a relatively large flap and close the donor defect um, uh, very easily. Moving around to the front, this is a patient with a pharyngoesophagectomy. Um, this was reconstructed with a, a, an ALT flap. There's the, the pedicle of the ALT flap, but he's also missing anterior neck skin. And um, there are several ways that you can close this. The commonest way to close this would be with a pec major flap to cover over the, the, the missing neck skin. The problem with the pec major is that um, sometimes it's bulky um, and sometimes that bulk will um, impinge on the, uh, the tracheostome and that, that um, tracheostome is permanent. So you may have to go back and debulk your flap if, if that bulk is too much. The even more traditional way of fixing this is with the delta pectoral flap. And the delta pectoral flap was popularized in the 60s. And in order to capture the territory over the deltoid, you need to delay it. Um, and then the donor site has to be uh, skin grafted. So it's very ugly. Uh, and as well as that, um, when you turn that flap to cover the neck, you're going to get a dog ear right where that tracheostome is. And you're going to have to go back and revise that. And so uh, we did this uh, several years ago, uh, planning a uh, pec major flap, as you can see here. But we got, got the Doppler out. And what we found is this is the thoracocromial artery, which is much more lateral than you would expect it to be. And over here, are these are two perforators coming from the internal mammary system. And what we did was to take a, 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 the intervening costal cartilage out to go down to the mammaries, divided the internal mammary just distal to the runoff of these two perforators. And then we could uh, tunnel that flap up into the neck. And that's an IMAP flap. Uh, and you get the same territory as a, a pec major without the downside of taking the, taking the muscle and you're not going to have to go back and revise this flap. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a really useful flap for many reasons. This is another case. Uh, this guy had a T4 squam cell carcinoma the floor of the mouth. Um, and what you're looking at is, um, uh, let me go back, back there. He's got exposed plate, what looks like a tooth in his lower jaw. That's actually exposed plate. He was reconstructed with a fibula. So we went back and uh, elevated the lip element to close over the, uh, the hole in the floor of his mouth and then excised that uh, dystrophic skin on his neck. But this neck was like cement and he wasn't a candidate for any sort of dissection within the neck. And so we did uh, bilateral uh, IMAP flaps. And um, you can see the nice large pedicle. This is the second uh, intercostal, uh, per, or the second perforator coming from the internal mammary in the second intercostal space. Uh, and then just rotated both of those flaps up, closed the, uh, the defect, uh, and here he is postoperatively. So it's, it's a very useful flap. And you can use it for, for all sorts of defects. Um, this is a guy with a, a squamous uh, a basal cell carcinoma uh, at the root of his neck. Um, and um, this goes with a IMAP flap. You can see the, 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 the dot on the, the doctor signal. And actually, when we dissected out, we found two perforators. I put a clamp on the more distal perforator to make sure that my uh, proximal um, IMAP perforator would carry the flap, which it did. And then you simply uh, dissect down in the interspace to get enough length in your perforator, rotate it into the defect, and again, get your Doppler out to make sure that you've still got your signal and, uh, you, and, and close it. And you can also use it as a very small flap. So, this is a patient that I operated on just about a week ago. She's a 44-year-old woman uh, with uh, carcinoma of the breast. She's had bilateral mastectomies. She's got radiation on the left side. And she developed, um, she developed a metastatic disease in her axilla uh, that was so extensive that it uh, blocked the venous outflow of her left arm. And so she had an extra anatomic stent um, placed. And I asked them, when they asked me this here, I said, well, can you take out the stent and we'll put a new one in, I'll cover it with a flap. And they said, no, can't really do that because that stent goes from her right atrium right over to her arm um, and was exposed. And she, um, so she uh, had exposure of a stent there. And she always had, also had impending exposure of her port. So she needed that closed. And so this is what we did. This is a, an IMAP that we've advanced as a V2Y. 
and we've deepithelialized a segment of that to cover over the stent and wrap around the stent. And then this is a supraclavicular perforator that we've just advanced as a V2I. Again, just finding the, the perforator with the Doppler and just advancing it. And then over here, we've got another IMAP flap that we're going to use to cover the, um, the, the, the paper thin skin over her port. Um, you can see it's a nice large um, uh, pedicle, nice uh, robust perforator. And here you can see the exposed, um, the exposed port. Um, and she, she just sent me these, these pictures. She's due to come in, I think, later this week to have her stitches out. Now, another very useful flap is the, um, the dorsal scapular artery uh, perforated flap. It's basically, it's basically a trapezius flap without the muscle. Um, this was described by Claudia Agrigiani in 2003. And uh, the advantage of it is that apart from the fact that you don't take muscle, um, you get the same advantage of any perforated flap. You get a longer pedicle. Um, so you can take your, um, your uh, skin paddle higher up in the back. You, you recognize that one of the downsides of the trapezius flap is that sometimes in order to get it to reach where you need, the uh, skin paddle is barely on the trapezius. Whereas here, you're taking skin paddle with the, with the uh, dorsal scapular artery going right into it. You take it through the trapezius and under the rhomboid. Uh, and uh, this is a patient with a recurrent uh, sarcoma in her uh, and the root of her neck. Uh, this is her dissection. Uh, and, and this we've uh, closed with a, a dorsal scapular flap. And because you don't have the bulk of the muscle, you can see that you can tunnel it uh, from the back very nicely without having to deal with, with a, a thick uh, muscular flap. Um, so it's, it's a great flap um, that, that, that I like a lot. Now, Mustafa Hamdi, who is a surgeon in Brussels, um, when he was in Ghent, um, uh, published a, a paper on the intercostal artery perforator flaps. And these are very useful flaps, and there are several of them. There's the posterior intercostal perforator, the lateral intercostal perforators, and the anterior intercostal artery perforator. And um, the, the, the posterior one, this is a, a case, one of the cases that he published at that time. This is a young woman with a dermatofibrous sarcoma on her back. That's in the midline of her back. You can see he's doppered out a, a posterior intercostal perforator and designed a flap around it. And you can see that the pedicle is really um, quite, uh, quite robust. And um, uh, that's simply tunneled into the defect. Um, and um, this is not advancing for some reason. There we go. Um, you can see the flap tunneled into the defect right here. That secondary defect can be closed directly giving you a, a very a nice result, um, uh, ultimately. So it's a very, very useful flap. Um, this is one of my favorite flaps. This is the anterior intercostal perforator flap. And this is another patient, uh, this is another one of uh, Mustafa's patients with uh, dermatofibrous sarcoma. And um, you don't want to distort the breast in this patient. Uh, you don't want to put a skin graft on there if you can avoid it. Um, and this incision is made in the, uh, this is the inframammary fold right here. And here you can see the perforator. Um, and you look at the perforator and make sure you're happy with it, and then you design your flap. And uh, in this case, uh, it's advanced as a V2Y, uh, giving you very satisfactory closure, very nice result with no distortion of the breast. And the donor scar is right here in the, in the inframammary fold. Um, this is a patient of my own, uh, also with a, a sarcoma of the anterior chest. Same thing, um, anterior intercostal perforator uh, advanced as a V2Y and giving you a very satisfactory result. Now, the lateral intercostal perforator um, can be used for lateral chest wall or for lateral breast defects, um, uh, such as this one, uh, where you have a patient with um, uh, upper outer quadrant uh, tumor uh, requiring a lumpectomy, um, and this can be reconstructed with the lateral intercostal perforator, which is here. And here's the anatomy. You can see that the perforator is really quite, uh, quite robust. You can see the intercostal nerve, and then that's simply tunneled uh, into the defect on the lateral breast um, and, a, and a donor defect closed. So it gives you a very satisfactory uh, closure. And the nice thing is that the, the scar can be hidden nicely under clothing. Um, the the thoracodorsal uh, can also be used for partial reconstruction or for other reconstructions, as I'll show you. This is a woman uh, with a, a, a more medial uh, tumor in her breast requiring um, a fairly large uh, segmental uh, 
parenchymal excision as well as skin excision. And that's about the size of a parenchymal excision. Um, there is the latissimus dorsi uh, coming through the, um, coming through or the thoracodorsal dorsal perfect, coming through the latissimus dorsi. And um, it reaches very nicely, uh, much more immediately. This is a video, it's not a good quality video, but it just shows you how big and robust this uh, perforator is. So here's just being dissected out from within the latissimus. The one thing you have to be aware of when you come through the latissimus, uh, the nerve is running right on the pedicle. So you have to tease the nerve off it. But here you can see the pulsatile, nice big perforator of the Tdap. Um, and um, in this particular case, it was used nicely to fix that um, uh, quadrantectomy defect on, on her breast, as you can see. This is another, this is one of my own patients with um, sarcoma of the uh, upper arm. And we've just pedicled a thoracodorsal perforator down there. So it gives a very nice uh, reconstruction for that area too. This is um, one of my patients who, she was burnt as a, a child in Vietnam in a cooking accident. And she, I think is the worst scar former I've ever come across. When I first um, came across her, she couldn't close her mouth because of scarring her neck. And so that's a, a free periscapular flap that I put up. Um, in fact, she, she then started to scar down her, uh, her anterior chest. Uh, sorry, let me go back there. And I removed the, all the old skin graft and put Integra and new skin grafts on and the whole thing scrunched down again. So I ended up doing a second, um, a second um, periscopular flap on that one. Uh, but I wanted to release the scar contracture in her axilla. Um, there is the periscopular flap. And this is the scar from her uh, periscopular flap. And you can see over here in the middle, you can see um, a, a dot where I've doppered out a vessel. And simply opening that old scar so we can have a look at that vessel, we found that it was an, a big robust vessel coming from the uh, serratus branch. And so once I was able to see the vessel, we could go ahead and uh, release that uh, scar contraction axilla, uh, design the flap uh, and rotate the flap very nicely um, and close that secondary defect. So just to show you that because you've been in one area before, it doesn't mean you can't take a flap uh, from uh, the similar area, just from a different blood supply. Here's that flap at the end of that procedure. And this is her now. Uh, as I mentioned, she's a terrible scar former. So this is one periscopular flap. This is the second periscopular flap. This is that serratus flap that I use for her axilla. And this, these two are uh, dorsal scapular perforator flaps to release lateral contractures in her neck. And it looks awful, but it, she's very happy because she's fully mobile and free and no longer tethered by these scars. So just to show you, you can use lots of uh, different flaps from, from similar regions to, to reconstruct defects. Moving on down the body, the, the skip flap is a, is a great flap. Um, I use the skip flap uh, as a skin flap, which I'll show you, but I also use it as um, if I'm doing a lateral inguinal uh, lymph node transfer, it's, it's the same blood supply. The difference is the skin flap is taken above scarpers, the, the uh, uh, lymph node flap is taken below scarpers. This is a, a 28 year old patient with a squamous cell carcinoma of the vulva requiring a radical vulvectomy. And this is her excision. And you see we've designed uh, two pedicle skip flaps. And these rotate down very nicely to cover the defect. Um, and uh, the donor defect is really nice because it's just a scar on the groin crease. You can see that we've closed the back of the defect with, um, sorry, let me go back there. We've closed the back of the defect with rhomboid flaps. But these skip flaps give you nice thin uh, skin that's really, really, really useful. Um, JP Hong in Seoul uses the skip flap as his go to flap for many uh, uh, of the flaps that he uses for, for diabetic uh, foot ulcers. Um, and th this is just an example of another patient, a patient with, uh, with the sarcoma there is in a free skip flap on. It was just at the top of her breast. Uh, so I didn't want to add any uh, bulky tissue to, to that to distort her breast. And the really nice thing about this flap is look at the donor scar. It's just a scar on the groin crease. So it's, it's really, really nice. And, and one of my favorite flaps. Moving around the back, the, the ESCAT flap, we often think of as a, a, like a backup flap for breast reconstruction, but it's also very useful as a pedicle flap. Uh, this is a guy with a sarcoma, uh, and the sarcoma is, is, uh, is right over his ischium. Uh, so he's gonna be sitting on whatever you put there. So you wanna make sure that you put a nice uh, bulky flap there. 
And in this case, we've just used an S-gap flap, and you can see how thick that flap is, and just pedicle it down into the defect. You can see that his, uh, his muscle is intact. This guy is ambulatory, so you wanna make sure that you don't interfere with his gluteus. Uh, and here he is at the end of the case, and here he is sometime later with a nice bulky flap um, covering that ischium. Um, so it's, I, I find it a very useful flap for uh, reconstruction of areas of the buttock, for uh, the lower back, I've used it for patients uh, who've had posterior accentuation, uh, particularly if, this, if they've had a sacrectomy as well. Uh, and it, uh, it, it's a very versatile flap in that area. Of course, the, the anterior lateral thigh flap is, is one of the workhorse flaps that I'm, I'm sure everybody uh, uses. Um, and um, this is the blood supply coming from the descending branch of the lateral circumflex iliac. And uh, about 15% um, about of the time, um, the, the perforator will be a septocutaneous perforator. More commonly, about 85% of the time, it's a muscular cutaneous perforator going through the, the vastus lateralis. Um, this is the rectus femoris. This is the vastus lateralis. And here you see the pedicle um, going down under the, the vastus lateralis um, and sending perforators up through that. And one of the uh, nice things about the, the ALT flap is, is that, as I was saying at the beginning, you only take the tissue that you want. So this is um, this is a uh, fascia cutaneous ALT flap. We've taken the fascia with us. It's got a nice big pedicle, as you can see. Um, and uh, the dissection of, of, the, um, of this flap um, is, um, oh, sorry, I don't know how to, uh, the dissection of this flap, I'm not sure why that's not working. There we go. Um, I usually start medially. Um, this one is actually a, a septic cutaneous, uh, a, a super fascial flap. So for the, um, for this, I'm just going to stop this for a second. For the standard um, subfascial dissection, I start medially. I go through the fascia. I find a septum between the vastus and the rectus, and I go down and I find my pedicle, and and do my dissection kind of antegrade. What I'm showing you now is a superfascial dissection because you have the option to not take fascia, and for the superfascial dissection, I start laterally, and I uh, go along the fascia. I've doppered out my pedicle. My, my perforators, and uh, he, and I do this in exactly that. There's the perforator right there, and I do this in exactly the same way as I would do a DIP. I open up the fascia um, and and do it in a retrograde manner, dissecting along the perforator through the vastus uh, down to the, the main source vessel. And that way, you can take a nice thin flap. You can even take this flap uh, by dissecting at uh, a level. Um, just above scarpas. Uh, so you, you just take scarpas with you. Uh, so it's a very, very thin flap. You find the perforators and do uh, the dissection exactly the same way as I'm showing you here. Um, so here's a superfascial uh, ALT. Much like I showed you before, I've clamped the, one of the perforators to make sure that the other perforator is going to be sufficient to take the flap. If it's not sufficient, then you have a lot more dissection to do. Um, but if it's sufficient uh, to perfuse a flap on one pedicle, then it's a, it's, a, it's a very quick case. And one of the nice things about not taking the fascia is that it makes your donor closure very, very easy. Um, and uh, so a lot of the flaps that I do are superfascial. And also the advantage of the superfascial flap is that you can thin it very safely. So here's an ALT flap. You can see how much flap, how much fat I've dissected off that. Um, but as I said, alternatively, you can, you can uh, do the dissection at the level of scarpas. There's just a few clinical examples. There's a guy with a, a metastatic carcinoma of the colon, a metastatic to the anterior abdominal wall. Um, here's his resection. And this is reconstructed with a, really a thigh flap, uh, taking a lot of fascia, smaller amount of skin. This is the descending branch of the lateral circumflex femoral, supplying the ALT and the fascia. This is the transverse branch supplying the TFL. And this is tunneled under the rectus femoris. You see the retractor holding up the rectus femoris. And when you're doing this, you, you need to be cognizant of the blood supply of the rectus femoris. There are usually two perforators uh, supplying it. And, and most of the time, you can tunnel your uh, ALT under, under it without dividing either of the, of the perforators. You can generally uh, get away with dividing one of them without uh, devascularizing the muscle. But if you have to take uh, all of the blood supply from the rectus, you're going to kill the rectus. And what that does is that it gives the patient um, an extensor lag in, in knee extension. In the same way that if you, if you take the rectus femoris um, as, a, as a flap and don't repair the extensor mechanism, you're going to get an extensor lag as well. 
And so this is just tunneled up under rectus femoris and the skin, uh, the, the large piece of fascia is used to, to repair the abdominal wall and the skin obviously to close the, the skin. Uh, this is a more traditional type of ALT. This is a guy with the sarcoma in his groin. And here I don't need fascia. So this is just taken as a superfascial flap, again, tunneled under the rectus femoris. Um, you can always recognize the rectus femoris by the dense white uh, fascia on the under, under surface of it. You can see the pedicle going under it there. Uh, and here's his, uh, here's his flap. Generally, I, I like to close my ALT uh, donor site. Um, if, if, I'm, if I need a flap that's not going to allow me to close the donor site, then I'll probably choose a different flap because a skin graft on the thigh uh, is A, unsightly, and B, a, a lot of patients complain of it. Um, so this is a guy with a squamous cell carcinoma of the penis who's had a partial penectomy bilateral groin dissections, radiation, and obviously has broken down with the exposure of these nerves. And the rectus femoris would probably be the common way to repair this. But in this young guy, I didn't want to take both of his rectus femoris muscles and risk um, giving him bilateral knee extensor lag. So we just reconstructed with the uh, ALT. Uh, again, brought under, uh, brought under rectus femoris, taken as a superfascial flap, and uh, partially deepithelialized to fill the dead space. And then, as you can see, the secondary defect closed, uh, closed directly. Here he is post-operatively. Now, sometimes um, I mentioned that uh, I still use um, lots of uh, old-fashioned, if you like, flaps. This is a guy with a scrotal eye, my sarcoma. And when I got called to the operating room, the first thing I saw was the specimen in the bucket and then looked at the, uh, at the table. And this is what I saw. And, once you pick yourself up off the ground after you see something like this, then you just need to think it's true. And um, there's no problem with his abdominal wall. He's just got this hung big retractor, which you take out and you can close the abdominal wall. So it's really a pelvic problem. And so to reconstruct this, we did a VRAM flap, which was deepithelialized, um, folded on itself, sewn to itself and sewn to the pelvic rim. So that solved the pelvic floor problem. And now you've just got a perineal problem. And with this particular guy, he had both urinary and bowel diversion. So you don't have to worry about any uh, holes in your flap. Uh, and this is just closed with the, with the pedicled uh, ALT. And the, the pedicled ALT is, is great for the perineum. So um, when I was training, I was taught that the one place that you had to have a free flap was in the distal third of the leg. In the proximal third, you could use gastroc. In the middle third, you could use soleus. But distal third, you have to use a free flap. And, and that's no longer true. This is a, a, an, an elderly lady with a squamous cell carcinoma of her ankle. Uh, her ankle is right at the bottom of the picture. And this lady wasn't fit for, for anything. Uh, and this is, a, um, this is a posterior tibial perforator flap. And uh, you can see it's a nice, robust pedicle. Again, dissected down to the source vessel to make sure you've got adequate length. And this is just a video clip to show you how much uh, movement you get out of this flap. Um, so you'll see the, the, the glove on her foot down there, we're right down at her ankle, and that flap goes way down there. So it's a, it's a great uh, flap for, for defects around here. Uh, and this is how you do it. So in the middle of the picture, you're seeing the perforator make that in, ex, exploratory incision to, to check that your perforator is okay. And then you dissect your flap. Um, and again, this is a superfascial dissection um, uh, down to your perforator, find the perforator, go through your fascia, dissected all the way down to your um, source vessel. Again, I'm going to just speed this up in the interest of time here. Um, now you see you've got a nice, a nice big perforator, uh, and we're going to get our Doppler out, make sure that our signal is still present, and then we're going to rotate it into the defect, uh, make sure that our signal is still present on the defect. Um, if it's not present, you go back and do some more dissection around the, uh, around the perforator. Um, and uh, once you're happy that the Doppler signal is good, then you close up and go home. Um, speed this up a little more. So now we're just rotating it into the defect, um, getting the Doppler signal going again. And that, that uh, donor defect, you can either skin graft or usually you can close these. Um, and this is, what, um, this is what this looks like afterwards. Um, so it's, it's a great flap for uh, distal lower limb uh, defects.
So the back is an area that I, I, I used to think of as, as free flap no man's land. It's always difficult to find vessels to plug into. And um, this is a, a, a young woman who had a sarcoma in her back closed with, um, uh, I'm not sure why this is doing this, uh, closed with uh, rhomboid flaps, as you can see here, and radiated, and she now has recurrence. And so she needed a large excision, and uh, this is the area that we're going to excise. And you, you can see the, 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 the marks of an egg crate mattress, because before we did the excision, I harvested a DIEP flap with her supine, and then closed that, turned her over on the prone position, did the excision, and plugged the flap in. Uh, there's her defect and there's her flap and it worked fine but it was a, an all day case that was a pain in the ass because we had to turn her a couple of times uh, and it worked fine but this is what i now do for something like that this is a guy with a squamous cell carcinoma on his back and we're going to close this with keystone flaps and the keystone flap is a, a wonderful flap uh, that i use for all sorts of things um, and with the keystone flap, you make an incision through skin, subcutaneous tissue and fascia. You do a little bit of undermining at the leading edge, but no other undermining. And then you just advance it and close it. And the secondary defect gets closed with the V to Y closure. And um, so the keystone flap was described by this man. This is Felix Bean, who's a, a plastic surgeon in Melbourne, Australia. And it's called the keystone because of its shape, which is like the architectural stone keystone in an arch. Um, and if this is uh, uh, any defect, uh, you drop tangents from it and, and uh, you um, join those tangents with a curved line at the back. And the, the width of your flap is about one to one and a half times the width of the defect. And then you just uh, undermine, uh, you just go incise skin, uh, subcutaneous tissue and fascia. Um, and you do a little bit of undermining the anterior uh, edge for about a couple of centimeters and then advance it. So that's only, only undermining you do is at the leading edge. And then um, I generally close that defect first, leaving me with the secondary defect at the back. And that's closed with a V to Y on each side, which allows you to close the whole thing. Uh, this is, I think, the largest one I've ever done. This is a guy with a, a recurrent sarcoma on his back that we closed with uh, two giant uh, keystones. Um, uh, you know, a really difficult case that actually didn't take that long to do um, and, and got him closed safely. Um, and this is a, a recurrent carcinoma of the breast requiring chest wall excision. And just to show you the amount of advancement that you get, here's her excision, there's her flap. Look at that amount of advancement that you get. And here she is closed. So it's an amazing, an amazing flap that you can use anywhere. This is just a video clip to show you the amount of advancement you get from a keystone flap. This guy has exposed hardware on his back, as you can see. Um, and he's, uh, he's had a little bit of undermining at the very front and otherwise no undermining. And you can see how much adv advancement you get. And if that isn't enough to close your defect, you can do a keystone from the other side in order to get uh, tension-free closure if you need it. Um, you can use it all sorts of places. This is a patient with melanoma in the sole of the foot, uh, closed with the keystone flap. The, the blue dye is just the isosulfan blue that we use for a central node biopsy. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this is another melanoma on, on, a, on a leg uh, just above the ankle, close with the keystone. Um, so to, to summarize all of this, I think the, all of these perforator flaps are, are a great addition to our armamentarium. Um, they give us multiple options. They increase our versatility at the reconstructive site, but, but also at the donor site. And, and they're lots of fun to do. So uh, thank you all very much. And as I said at the beginning, if anybody has any suggestions of things they'd like to see in the new textbook, just email me and let me know. Great. That was a tour de force, Peter. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have a number of questions. So if you don't mind, we'll go straight to the Q&A session. Um, sure. So a question from my good friend and colleague, Rebecca Shirley. Do you have any hints for the, to get into the right psychology for microsurgery? Any hints? Mm -hmm. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Do you have any hints to get into the right mindset and psychology for microsurgery? Not really. I mean, I, I treat microsurgery as any other type of surgery. I don't distinguish between micro and, and, and regular. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I, I always dissect these flaps with loops. Um, 
if if I'm concerned at all, I'll just bring the microscope in if, I, if I'm not seeing well enough. Um, and um, I think you need to get out of the mindset of, mindset of thinking that this is really difficult. It's not really difficult. It takes a lot of attention and care. You've got, you really have to concentrate, but it's not technically difficult to do. Mm -hmm. okay. um, question from Syed Salama. What is the maximum angle during rotation of flap to prevent kinking or perforators? I think about 180. Okay. Um, and, and again, if you're, doing, if you're doing a 180 rotation, you want to make sure that you have adequate length in your perforator so that when you turn it, you're not going to kink it. You're not, and like I said, one of the commonest mistakes I see is that people, they find the perforator and they say, oh, great, this is the perforator. They sort of dissect a little bit around it and then rotate it and they lose the Doppler signal. You got to go through the fascia, go down to the source vessel, make sure you've got adequate length and that there's no, you know, um, no schmaltz around the, around the pedicle that, that's going to strangulate it. Okay, and um, what do you think about perforator flaps in irradiated areas? Uh, I think I think they're I think they're okay. I mean, the the, the biggest um, my biggest concern with any flap in radiated area is not the flap itself; uh, it's the uh, the healing of the flap to the um, to the radiated bed. Um, I'll generally uh, usually if you if you need a flap in a radiated area, the, the the flap is going to come from the edge of the radiation rather than, you know, the, the middle of what was radiated. Cause it's usually, if it's something like, like a sarcoma, then the, the recurrence you're going to get is at the periphery of the treated field. Um, uh, so sometimes if I am concerned, so let's say the patient has very um, uh, significant radiation changes in the skin. Um, then sometimes in those patients, I'll get a CT angio to make sure that my, that the perforator is uh, looking okay. Mm. Um, and I'll make sure that, um, you know, that I've got a good doctor signal with it. Right. And again, um, with all of these perfect flaps, with all of these perfect flaps, look at the perforator before you commit to the flap. So make an exploratory incision, look at the perforator, make sure it's pulsating, that it's robust, uh, and, and then go ahead if you're happy. So you mentioned that you, you like the ICG. Do you, do you use it for all the perforator flaps or are there... Uh, are there times like the facial artery um, perforators? I presume you don't need to use the ICG for for those ones. No, you, you generally don't. I, I mean, it's readily available here. So if, if if I'm in any doubt, then I'll use it. It's it's much more reliable than the naked eye. You know, if if you clamp a perforator and look at the flap, it can look okay for a long time. Um, but the ICG doesn't lie. So if if I if I'm concerned in any way, then I just use it. Okay. And do you use uh, objective volume um, flow measures like like blood velocity or something? Does that do you use that to guide no. you? Okay. No, I just look at I just look at whether it, whether it progresses or not. Okay. Um, another question for the back defect reconstructed with the DEP flap. Which recipient vessels did you use? That was a lumbar artery perforator. Okay. That I used to plug into. Okay. Uh, just going down, perforator flaps of the upper arm, question mark. Yeah, well, um, I will frequently use, uh, I, I showed you a TDAP that I use for the upper arm. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's, uh, it's got a long, I showed you the pedicle, it's a long, robust pedicle, and it reaches very nicely into the upper arm. And, and you can take quite a large flap. Um, uh, I've frequently also used, uh, um, Keystone flaps in the upper arm it works very well there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, let me see. Lots of questions. Inspiring presentation. Would you would you choose a free flap as a first choice for areas of previous radiotherapy rather than the local flaps, as the Doppler assessment doesn't help with diffusion quality? Well, yeah, you've you touched if, on that. Um, really. Yeah, if. If, the, if there's a local flap that, that looks okay, that is at the edge of the radiation field, then I'm, I'm happy to use it. But in general, I will, I will choose to use a free flap from okay. a non-radiated area to a radiated area. Okay. Lots of questions about the keystone flap. Um, do you monitor your keystone flaps um, post-op 
can you use it to close myeloma meningocele cells? Um, and one argument um, when talking about Keystone flaps, one argument is what to do if your flap fails uh, and any hints to prevent such eventuality. So the, the, the wonderful thing about the perforator flap is you don't need to monitor it. You don't need to dissect out perforators and your flap is relying not on one, but on usually multiple perforators. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's really, really good for closing myeloma and um, And um, the, the one place that you can't do a keystone flap, you can't do a keystone flap on the scalp. The scalp just has an axial flow. It doesn't, it doesn't have individual perforators. Um, or if, if, you, if, if it does, they're extremely small. So you can't, you can't do a keystone on the scalp. Um, I've, never had one, I've never had one die. Um, it, 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 they're incredibly robust. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't mind. Uh, question about the Doppler. How do you differentiate the main vessel from the perforator using the handheld Doppler signal? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been fooled a couple of times. Um, Usually, usually you're not. Uh, like I showed you with the facial artery, if you if you move your Doppler along, you hear these crescendos of noise. So, if you, if you think you're on if you think you're on the main vessel and you're moving your Doppler along the vessel and the sound doesn't change, then you're probably listening to the main vessel. But if you hear the, the sound change and you hear a, you know a louder whoosh, that that's probably a perforator. But I have been I have been fooled a few times, so it's not foolproof. Okay. Um, a couple of questions on your views on using perforators within the injured trauma zone. Yeah, I think, I think that is one area that um, uh, I'm, I'm very careful about. Um, if, you, if, you have, uh, if you're using um, a perforator in a, a lower limb trauma, for example, you, need, you really need to be sure that, uh, that, that that perforator isn't in the zone of injury because that that will result in a dead flap. And in that situation, I'll often, uh, um, you know, depending on the type of trauma, uh, if it's something like a crush injury or something like that, then I won't even go with a perforator flap. I'll go straight to something different like a free flap. Mm. Question from Dar um, Darius. Um, do you still use muscle flaps like a gracilis or LD for lower limb, especially for patients with very high BMI in which an AOT may not be very good? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I do. I use I use uh, uh, all of the above: latissimus, rectus, bacillus, whatever. Yeah. Okay. And and you're right. I mean, perforator flaps are not for the morbidly obese. Yeah. Um, and okay, question from Yarosh. Um, Professor J. P. Hong recently mentioned that there's a dominant side of rotation of the perforator flap. Um, what, what do you think about this? And I think I think that's right. Um, um, I think that's right up to a point. And in fact, uh, Michel Sincere has shown that has, has published on that um, that there is an axiality to these flaps, um, and a lot depends on on where the adjacent perforators are. Um, so often, if if, I've, if I'm designing a flap and I found a nice perforator, then I will Doppler out all the other perforators in the area uh, and see. Um, see where they are, because that will guide me as to where I should, uh, where I should place the axis of my flap. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, in the lower leg, if I'm doing posterior tibial perforator, the posterior tibial perforators, there are several of them running uh, along the posterior tibial. So you need to keep, if you want to capture a couple of different perforator zones, you need to keep your flap in that axis. Um, so how do you decide um, whether, let's say a lower limb fracture, whether to use a perforator flap or when to use a free flap, what's your algorithm? A lot depends on the on the mechanism of injury. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if there's you know if there's uh, an element of crush or burn or something like that, then you know if it's a motorcycle accident, then I won't use a, I won't use a perforator flap. I may use a perforator flap as a free flap, but I won't use it as a pedicle flap. Oh yes, okay. Uh, question from Sudip Ghosh, who's um, one of my colleagues and a good friend. Do you have much experience with perforator flaps in pressure sores? No. <laughs> Short answer. <I> think. <laughs> Any views on, on, on that? I, I don't see why they wouldn't work. I mean, it's uh, as long as as long as you you're putting robust tissue, like that guy I showed you with the sarcoma of his issue, um, 
Yeah. I mean, that's a similar sort of situation where you want a you know, bulky flap that's going to cover a bony prominence. Uh, so there's no reason why that wouldn't work. I, I just, in my practice, I don't do a lot of pressure sores. Mm -hmm. Fortunately. Um, do, you, do you use the thermography um, in your flap follow-up? Um, no, I, I, I haven't done that. Um, I use ICG sometimes in my flap follow-up, uh, but there's no reason why uh, why thermography wouldn't work. And in fact, it's something somebody suggested to me, I, I gave this talk a week or so ago and somebody suggested it, I'm definitely going to try it. Okay. Um, a question on wh where to download the thermography app. Is that, uh, have you got one you can recommend? The one I use is called FLIR, F-L-I-R. And it's, it's the, the camera is called a FLIR one. And it's available in the Apple store or the, or the um, uh, you can also get it for Android. And uh, when, once you buy the camera, it, it uh, tells you where to download. You just download the app from the, um, from the Apple store, from the Android store. Okay. Um, so many questions. <laughs> um, Okay. Okay. Do, for random perforator flaps, do you always dissect right through the fascia, um, and if so, any risk that that will make the perforator weaker and kink? No. Um, no. no. Okay. I always, I, yeah, I always go through the fascia. And it, it doesn't weaken it doesn't weaken things at all. Okay. Obviously, you want to make sure that your pedicle isn't tight, or that you know, if you're advancing it as as a you know an advancement flap, you want to make sure that it's not tight, because um, that that'll kill your flap. Um, or if you're rotating it, like I said, you want to make sure that it's not kinking. Yeah. Okay. What's your protocol for dangling post free or perforator um, um, perforator flap? Any particular dangling yeah. protocol for low limb? Yeah, well, I usually keep them on bed rest for five days, and then I start uh, start a dangling protocol. Um, and, and we do we start off with ten minutes uh, three times a day, and then increase it fairly rapidly. And usually get them out of the hospital within about seven or eight days. Okay. Um, Tarek Dash um, says I've used perforated flaps on the face and lower leg, and in two, on two occasions, I suffered prolonged lymphedema afterwards of the flap and surrounding area. Any tips to avoid that? I have to say, I haven't really seen that, that problem. Uh, I mean, it can happen with any flap. Is, is he talking about lymphedema in the flap or lymphedema in the surrounding area? Uh, both. Yeah. Um, I mean, you will, you will sometimes see uh, bulky flaps uh, and, and often what I'll do is I'll put them in compression um, to get rid, of the, get rid of the lymphedema, it usually solves the problem. Okay. Another question about the um, pre-op Doppler. Um, do, you, do you ever get the radiologist to mark out the perforators or do you do it all yourself? And what type of handheld Doppler do you use? No, we do, it, we do it ourselves in the operating room. We have sterile doctors, uh, so we do it on the field um, and just mark them out. And we use the, 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 the commonest um, doctor that we use is, is called a Hawkinson. I think it's H-A-W-K-I-N-S-O-N. It's a sterilizable doctor. Great. Um... I, th I think we've covered most of the questions. Oh, that, that, just one Great. more thing. There, there's been a number of questions um, on congestion and perforator flaps. Mm -hmm. What's the incidence and how do, you, how do you prevent it from happening? Um, I don't think there's, if, uh, in, in my experience, there's no difference in, in free flaps in terms of congestion between a, a free perforator flap or free any other kind of flap. Um, sometimes with the uh, with the pedicle perforated flaps, you certainly do see some congestion, um, uh, and that's pretty common. Uh, and it's it's I usually con consider it as if, if, if the if the background color is pink, I'm happy, even if there's a little bit of blue in it. But if the whole thing is blue, I have a very short fuse for using leeches. So if I'm concerned at all, then I put leeches on the flap. Uh, 
All right. Um, great. Yeah, I think we've covered most topics. Great. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. It's one of the um, difficulties with webinars that we can't give you a round of applause, but I'm sure everybody is doing that right now. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. No, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah. And fantastic. Take care. Bye. Okay, take care. See you soon.